So I'm often asked, what's the best method to learn mathematics or computer science? This is a very good question. In fact, a century ago, the great mathematician David Hilbert was precisely searching for an answer to this question. He wanted a systematic approach to prove mathematical theorems, or as computer scientists today would ask, can we solve every mathematical problem with an algorithm? And Turing tried to address that question, and in order to address the question, he wanted to define precisely what an algorithm means. This was Professor Rashid Girari of the IC School at EPFL, and the question he's asking is one of the deepest questions ever asked in the history of mathematics. What's an algorithm? Intuitively, an algorithm is a set of instructions that could be executed by anyone. So basically, an algorithm is like a very detailed recipe. In fact, it is so detailed that if you do follow very precisely the instructions of an algorithm, you would eventually obtain the exact same result as would anyone else who did apply the instructions of the algorithm as well. And this is very useful because it allowed mathematicians to describe very precisely how to solve problems, in particular by designing an algorithm to solve a particular case. Mathematicians were also providing a way to solve all future similar problems, even those problems that no one has yet thought about. Not surprisingly, this is something that mathematicians started working on for a very long time and they called it algorithm because the first person who let's say, formalized this notion, is who was called Algorithm himself. His full name was Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khawarizmi. Wow, look at that, how good is my accent? Al-Khawarizmi described a very precise algorithm to solve a whole class of problems called the second degree equations. The details don't really matter. That was a long time ago, the 8th century. And since then, people have been inventing new algorithms and executing them themselves or asking non-mathematicians to execute them because they were simple instructions. In fact, before Turing's breakthroughs, computers were not machines. Computers were humans that were hired to perform the long and fastidious computations. Computers were humans that were here to run the algorithms that the mathematicians had devised. Even back then, mathematicians didn't really care about the computations, because mathematics is not about computations. What matters are not the calculations, what matters are the algorithms. Algorithms are very useful, again, since a long time ago, because they enable everyone to execute very complicated problems. In the very old times, only, for example, only very strong mathematicians could solve equations. But since the guy named Algorithm, he enabled everyone to think of an equation or a second degree equation and solve it immediately by calculating delta. So it became something very simple. So algorithms simplify complicated tasks. In fact, even back then, people started thinking what if machines would execute these instructions and hence execute the algorithms instead of uh, humans. So they started inventing machines. Pascal invented the machine, uh, Babbage invented the machine. They were all trying to invent a machine to execute a specific set of algorithms. So, for example, uh, Pascal was thinking of algorithms to compute taxes. Babbage was trying to build algorithms for some polynomial Bernoulli's numbers and things like that. And there were this think, this thought that every machine would, at most, do a set of algorithms. Let's stress this. Back then, mathematicians had realized that algorithms were the ways to go to solve problems. However, they thought that whenever they wanted to run a new algorithm, they had either to hire some human to run the algorithm, or they had to construct a specific machine to run this specific algorithm. And that was the general thinking until Turing. So in 1936, Alan Turing invented a machine much, much, much simpler than the machines that the others were inventing. But the machine of Turing was so simple that it was universal. Turing's machine consisted of a memory tape and a read and write apparatus with an internal state. The details are a bit technical, but the bottom line is absolutely fantastic. This machine was a universal computation machine. Universal in the sense that it could execute 
any possible algorithm. And this means that today, if you want to run a new algorithm that you've just thought of, you don't need to build a whole new machine for your specific algorithm. You can just use one of the many universal Turing machines that surround us. Servers, laptops, phones, all of them are able to run your new algorithm. And this is pretty much magic. But how does it all work? How can a single machine like your phone compute any algorithm? The, the Turing machine is universal because, uh, as I pointed out, it enables to execute every algorithm and it does so because it is so simple that the program or the algorithm as described by a Turing machine can itself be entered as a data of the algorithm. So you can have an algorithm of which the data or the parameter is an algorithm itself. In terms of Turing machines, this means that if I have my universal Turing machine and if you bring me your Turing machine, then I can analyze your Turing machine and translate it into a set of instructions, a prefix of the data that I'll put on my universal Turing machine. And then whatever data you want to put in your Turing machine will just be copy pasted at the end of the data of my universal Turing machine in addition to the prefix that I did to describe your Turing machine. And amazingly, whatever result you get with your Turing machine with the data that you've put in, I'm going to get the exact same result using my universal Turing machine. The other machines before, they didn't have this feature. And this was the source or the, the crux of universality. And it's the way we understand today the difference between software and hardware. The Turing machine is a, is a hardware that enables to enter a software as, a, as an algorithm. And this has had major implications to the computer industry. It means that we can divide the software from the hardware. People interested in algorithms can focus without having to worry about the machine, about the best algorithm to solve their problem. They know by church turing thesis that they will be able to execute it on a machine. Wait, what's the church turing thesis? The church turing thesis is a conjecture that says any algorithm that one could think about is uh, executable on a Turing machine, could be formalized, executable on a Turing machine. Yes, because the universality of the Turing machine only implied that any other Turing machine could be simulated by the universal Turing machine. However, one might assume that there could be some very different kind of machine that was not a Turing machine, and that would be able to compute algorithms that the universal Turing machine cannot. Well, the church Turing thesis postulates that there is no such other machine. Every computation machine is a sort of Turing machine, or at least it can be simulated by a universal Turing machine. Note that this thesis itself cannot really be proved because it has to do with our physical reality. In fact, there are models of mathematics in which you can devise algorithms, weird algorithms, that universal Turing machines cannot run. But such weird models of computations do not seem to fit our physical reality. We do not seem to be able to construct a machine that would run the algorithm of this very abstract mathematical model. In other words, the Church-Turing thesis is not only restricted to the theory of computation. Some people claim that it has major consequences about the structures of our universe and to the philosophy of mind. Now... I'm not going to get into that. What cannot be argued is the fact that the church Turing thesis has had major impact on the new technologies that we have and thus on our societies. Because of that thesis, today we have one single machine on which we execute everything. So all the machines we have, be they uh, our um, laptops or things in our cars or phones, are, are constructed following the model of, of Turing and therefore they uh, obey the, tour, the church Turing thesis. And because of that, we have one single machine, each of us, that does everything. Instead of having one machine to go on Facebook, another machine to go on Google, another machine to compute uh, calculations, etc. So there you have it. In 1936, Alan Turing tried to better understand Hilbert's quest of an algorithm that would solve all mathematical problems. And this algorithm, by the way, does not exist. And in trying to define what an algorithm means he tried to define a simple machine that would, a human machine, but a machine that would execute 
what could be called an algorithm. And by doing so, he invented the celebrated Turing machine. So the goal was to prove that something was wrong, and by doing so, he invented something very, very useful. Now, you might be under the impression that the Turing machine concept should have closed the matter of building hardware to compute. If the Turing machine is already universal, why bother carrying on research about Turing machines? In fact, the model was invented, but uh, the model of the machine simply says this is what you can do. It doesn't say how fast, with what amount of memory, uh, whether you can avoid mistakes or not. So since 1936, people are building Turing machines, but with various features, faster, or using less memory, less battery, uh, uh, can make less errors, can compile their programs in a nice way, etc. So the, 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 the inventions have to do with uh, more quantitative aspects than the qualitative aspects, which was designed by Turing in 36. We've never come up with a way of computing things that could do more than a Turing machine. We should consider not the set of all tests, but the set of effective tests.